I've been looking forward to this for some time, I'm not going to lie. Uh, I really dreaded it when uh, Pastor Swayze put me on the list to prepare something uh, before, well, because I felt really unprepared. Um, I still kind of do, but luckily, you know, with the leaders that I've got around me um, and the support structures, uh, you know, at least they get you through it and they kind of give you advice on what they've done. And so thank goodness I'm near to the end. Um, but leading up to uh, my actual message, I, I asked for a lot of, ooh, I asked for a lot of help uh, from God because I myself have not read the Bible from cover to cover. And as such, I felt quite inexperienced to actually be coming and giving off a lesson. Um, mind you then, I got sent over to Mafeking for three weeks, which I expected to only be one. Every time I tried to come back, something came up that kept me there. And that definitely leads up into what my message is tonight, because it was only on the last day that I received a lesson that has changed who I am now and completed my message. And with that, I'm essentially going to take you through the structure of uh, my, my message. I'm going to point out four facts that I've researched, along with two accompanying statements. And from those statements, I will then give my own, perso my own personal um, experience of that last day. Mind you, all three weeks were actually a miracle in itself. Uh, but the last day has plenty more focus in this regard. So my topic is where, I've, where is your focus? And generally this focus is on ourselves and not on God. And if it is on God, it is partial focus, if anything. Uh, something very difficult to do is have pure focus on, on, on the Lord all the time because we kind of get pulled up into our own uh, little worlds. And this is why. According to the Population Reference Bureau, the pro approximately 107 billion people have uh, experienced the gift of life, have walked on this planet and lived it. According to the same reference, 7.8 billion people currently live on this planet and are experiencing life. In one lifetime, it is possible to meet 70,000 people. That is 0.000897% of our population. Uh, now, this number is also averaged at three people every day from the age of five, uh, where we actually get cognitive memory to remember people in our lives. Um, furthermore, this is also on a level of purely being acquaintances as opposed to being friends or developing intimate relationships with these people you meet. So that number starts to drop even more from 70,000 probably down to a couple thousand, depending on our focus, again. Now, the odds of winning our national lottery, rounded up, is 300 million to one. The odds of actually being born, and this is an approximate number, is 400 trillion to one. Even at this number, which is quite the number, might I say, 400 trillion, um, we're going to have to go with this because I couldn't actually get another reference for um, the probability of actually receiving life. But if you consider all the actual variables that lead up to an ancestry of 107 billion people, everything had to be perfectly placed for you to be right here right now. Right? Of all the people you could possi possibly meet, we are meeting each other. That is not by chance. You know, if it was by chance, we could have been born in North Korea, where you've got a choice of 12 national hairstyles, perhaps. Or we could have been born in Syria, where there's constant bombings, and you're not able to practice your religion freely. 
There are so many more dire situations in this planet, yet we are only able to look at our own problems and magnify them as if they are what is important. So following up off of these uh, statistics, we go into statement one. Statement one, uh, God is the master of all. The architect of all that is created Indeed, God is the only one who makes up the category of the uncreated, as he is and always has been. Everything else is in the created category. This even includes archangels, thus making them closer to worms than they are to God. That is the true majesty of the God we serve, something that none of us can possibly fathom, yet we still try. You know, we're trying to understand God, but that's not, it's not something you can easily, it's not something you can achieve. I've tried, I've failed miserably. Now God makes no mistakes, for, he's, for He is absolutely perfect, in the known and the unknown. With, la with that in mind, let's focus on God as a master author. The Bible provides an account of the beginning in which God creates the earth. This is in Genesis. And then additionally, we are provided the conclusion in Revelations. One has occurred and the other is still to come. We indeed are somewhere in between, currently. We can guess all we want but only God knows when the latter will occur. So we can be skeptics, but we don't know God's plan. We've been placed at this point in time to, for a reason. That reason God writes for us as the master author. It is frivolous to, to try to determine our own reason for being. Instead, we should have faith that whatever our story is, God and only God can write it the best. We develop this faith through prayer and uh, practicing the teachings in the Bible. Not according to single pieces of scripture that suit us in our situation. That makes us feel good. Because the Bible is a tool in its entirety. That's how we received it. That's how we should learn it. Now... To go further on to that, we've got statement number two. We've all been blessed with the gift of life, as we've already uh, had a look at the odds. Now, despite those odds, this is indeed the first miracle we, will, we ever experience. Each and one of us experiences the gift of life, for we are all here right now. So, well done. You guys won the lotto hundreds, if not thousands of times in a row. As life is nothing short of that, each life as such beacons purpose for this exact reason on our probability. Each, each life is subject to its own experiences, events and happenings. And this is what makes us unique. Not our physical selves, because I don't recall getting a character select option before starting this journey. And I'm willing to bet that neither did any of you. Now, subject to the experiences, events, and happenings, we have been granted the gift of choice. Not just choice, but choice subject to the mercy of God. For I guarantee you, the majority of us, if not all, besides the children, would have been stoned to death in the Old Testament. Because of the choices we've made. But God waits patiently for us to choose Him. For God has taken the step of faith first. Jesus Christ sacrificed His life for us in the hopes that we choose Him. So, with that in mind, <clears throat> we get caught up in all our experiences, events and happenings, following one another like sheep off a cliff. We try to take control, for indeed we have been blessed with the ability to do so. However, 
when we do this, we set ourselves up to be uh, manipulated by the master manipulator. For he only has this power of manipulation when we turn our focus from God. And as bombastic as we may think we are to outsmart the devil, he has been around to toy with 107 billion people. And to think in our single turn at life, we can outwit him? I tell you now, that's arrogant and selfish. For a sheep without a shepherd is and eventually will be prey to the wolves. Now, those are my two statements on our gift of life and God naturally being the author that we should trust him in this. And we get to where we turn our focus to. I'd like to ask a couple of questions, all rhetorical naturally. Did I just do that? Yeah. So, I lost myself, excuse me. Ah, there we go. So I ask, where is our focus? Why do we focus on things like fame, social media attention, when we can't even meet a single percent of our population? Why focus on money when the most valuable currency is time? Why focus on our physical selves when we didn't even choose how we were made? Why focus on the opinions of others when we are only here once? Why focus on our past mistakes when we cannot change them? Why focus on the lives of others when we get to live our own? Now naturally, these are all rhetorical questions. Now I bring you to the attention of what God did for me as I prayed for help with this message. Uh, <laughs> when I was in grade 5 in Ebenezer Christian Family School, uh, we had certain corporal punishment in place, naturally. And our class had been unruly for the day, and we were subject to this punishment, which was to kneel with a brick above our heads for about 10 or 15 minutes. It's a very manageable punishment. You can ask my brothers, they had to do it as well. Uh, however, on the day, on this day, myself and two other students were exempted from this uh, punishment due to physical injuries. I had fallen out of a tree and a branch pierced my leg <laughs> about a week and a half prior. So our punishment, myself and these two other gentlemen, uh, were to go and write out three verses three times and return it in the next day. <sighs> now I misinterpreted this. Three verses for three chapters. And I spent several hours writing these chapters at home and I managed to get through it twice before my dad interjected and had me stop, saying he would give me a letter to hand over to the teacher, essentially saying it's unfair to have an 11-year-old write out three chapters in the Bible three times in one evening. Uh, I handed it over to teacher Philip, and uh, the following yeah, when I handed it over to him, he laughed at me and said I had punished myself for not listening. Now for the life of me, I heard him say three chapters. Um, but the other two students did three verses, so I guess I was wrong. And I remember... Yeah, yeah. Uh, so they handed in their stuff. Those three chapters that I had written, and before I reveal what those were, before I got baptized on the 11th of October, I also had spiraled for about three, three and a half years, where I'm very OCD in how I want things to be done. And I thought there was a way to make a roadmap to living the perfect life. 
I thought there was a way that you should live, you can live, and everything will work in your favor. Now, I was trying to write this out myself. I came up with several plans, and I couldn't keep to a single one of them. Um, and I naturally asked God for help with this post my uh, baptism. Now, those three verses that I wrote were chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew. Those of you familiar, we know that this is the Sermon on the Mount. Fast forward 10 years from that point um, to where I had been by my father now recently. Um, I was supposed to leave on Tuesday, uh, but instead, I, you know, I didn't want to take that transport. Not that I didn't want to, it was just really unsafe to take it. And my dad felt that I shouldn't leave and that I should stay one more day. And this is something that had been postponed several times already. I reluctantly decided to stay one more evening, although it is a privilege to spend that evening with my father. And we started talking about my topic tonight. And I explained how I hadn't finished it yet. I, I couldn't get to the end point. And, you know, I discussed where, what I'm trying to bring forth. And my dad, which he had referenced several times throughout the weeks that I'd been there, was to read the Sermon on the Mount. And as I read it, you know, my memory came rushing back. of When I was this 11-year-old boy writing these down. So now this whole time while I've been going out questioning how... Should I live? It was already planted in there 10 years ago. That's called being a master author. Now, <laughs> see, I've, I've been blessed, very much so. And arrogance, pride, selfishness, when you turn your focus away from God, you're easily manipulated, even if you have the answers, even if they've been provided to you. And while I was trying to write my own story, God had patiently wait, been waiting for me, waiting for his bigger picture, knowing me better than I know myself. Looking back, I can only be grateful for God's protection that he provided me while I deviated from him. And be eternally thankful that I was kept in Mafeking King one more day. The place this all took place in, 10 years ago, brought full circle. And I can honestly say the feelings that I felt when I did read the Sermon on the Mount again, uh, is a feeling like no other. When, when you finally see even one single connection that God has made in your life, and there's so many if you really turn your focus to what he's doing. If you really trust him with the decisions. Like King David. So essentially what I'm getting at is I'm letting God write my story now. If only he can write it the best. Our free will to make choices are as much a gift as the gift of life along with all its experiences, events, and happenings. We are all bestowed these gifts. So we, where are you going to direct yours? Use your Bible to build that relationship. Meditate on the scripture for understanding and allow it to equip you for what you have to deal with on that present day. Again, the Bible is a tool in its entirety. However, if you are wondering how we should live, I refer you to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew as these, teachers, these teachings come directly from our Father. Spend true undivided time with God so that He may guide you as He will always know what is best and in that you can trust. That's it. <laughs>